is told people who have TGA or any heart defect and want to be moms, it's not impossible. It's absolutely with modern medicine, you can do it. Welcome to Heart to Heart with Anna. I am Anna Jaworski and the host of your program. We are in season 15 and we're so happy you're here with us today. I'm very excited about today's show to feature a special heart warrior. Today's show is entitled DTGA and a Mustard Procedure Survivor. Barbara Angaroni was born with transposition of the great arteries, also known as TGA, ventricular septal defect or VSD, and coarctation of the aorta or COA. Her mother did not know about the defect. Therefore, she was born a blue baby and immediately rushed away for treatment. She had the muster procedure a few days later. Barbara had a very normal childhood and did not need any surgeries until she was in her 20s. She needed a pacemaker due to bradycardia. At that point in her life, she wondered if she would experience the joys of motherhood. Barbara's doctors seemed confident that she would be able to have children. In 2017, she gave birth to a healthy baby boy. However, she soon went into heart failure and had to return to the hospital for treatment. This was the biggest health scare she ever had to deal with. Welcome to Heart to Heart with Anna, Barbara Angaroni. Thank you for having me. Barbara, I haven't met many people who have had the mustard procedure. I'm so happy you're here to talk with us about this today. Now, you said you had that operation as an infant, so I'm sure you don't remember it, but I'm sure you do remember going into heart failure. Can you walk us through what happened? Uh, Absolutely. I was induced on a Wednesday, and I didn't have my baby until Friday, so it was 33 long hours of labor, and they said that probably contributed to the heart failure. I had him on a Friday. I went home on a Sunday from the hospital, and I just noticed Monday evening when I was trying to rest, my ankles were huge and my ankles never even got that big during my pregnancy. I was just like, okay, that's really weird. And then when I would try to lay down, I felt a heaviness in my chest. I'm like, this feels like fluid. I've never experienced drowning before, but it felt like water or something heavy in my chest. I was not in pain. I knew something was significantly wrong. I shouldn't have huge ankles like this after giving birth. I know your heart has to compensate after giving birth too, but I felt off. I did go to the emergency room and I had this four-day-old baby, so he had to find his grandma to babysit in the hospital. They never really met someone like me with my heart defect. The doctor was like, you should probably go back to where you gave birth because they know about you. You were just there. Your cardiologist is there. We're going to have you go to that hospital. So I was taken by ambulance, which I didn't think was necessary. And at the time, I should have been like, no, I don't need an ambulance. My husband could have driven me. But I was taken by ambulance back to the hospital where I gave birth and admitted. And I met my husband and the baby there. They were in a room with me and they started diuretics and everything for me. Now, was this in the same town or was this quite a distance apart? I gave birth in downtown Chicago and I lived out in the western suburbs. It was a 40 minute drive wasn't too bad. Okay. Okay. So you got back to the hospital where you had given birth. Now, why didn't you go to that hospital to begin with? Because it was so far away? Yeah. I thought that I could go to this emergency room. The doctor would be like, okay, this is what's wrong. Let's solve this really quick and be on your way. I didn't realize that they were like, no, you're very medically complex. You need to go back to where they're familiar with you, especially because you gave birth. Well, yeah. I mean, you are complex because you're postpartum. Things can still happen. It can be a little yeah. bit scary, I'm sure. Now, the baby was just fine while you were going through oh, yeah. all of this, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so now you're in a hospital. They've decided to give you diuretics. Does that influence your ability to produce milk for the baby? Were you trying to breastfeed the baby? I was. And I had issues anyway, despite what was happening with the fluid retention, just because I think of the mustard operation. I think a lot of things were switched inside my chest cavity and I had difficulty with it because of that. I don't think it was necessarily because of the fluid overload, but I was struggling in the hospital at that time. I decided six weeks later, this is too hard. This is too painful. I was trying to pump. It was too much. The second I stopped, I could focus more on taking care of my baby. 
breastfeeding isn't for everyone, but kudos, no, they don't to, tell you. You that. <laughs> kudos yeah. to you for trying for six weeks when you were struggling. And I've heard from other mothers too, that they tried and tried and it was so stressful. And we know that makes milk production more difficult. So then yeah. you're working at odds with one another. It's just not worth it. You need to be enjoying the time with your baby. And if all you're doing is struggling over the breastfeeding, then that takes away all that enjoyment. I think that was a smart decision, but I know having breastfed children myself, I know how heartbreaking it is. Yeah. Nobody tells you how difficult it can be to no. be a mother psychologically. That's one of those things that psychologically can be really challenging. And it's interesting. None of the doctors told you since you had this muster procedure and they were moving around inside of your chest that maybe that might make breastfeeding difficult. No, they didn't. I think it's very individual. Definitely with one breast, the one near my heart, it was way harder. The other one, it was way easier. But I'm like, this is still too painful. I, I'm not even going to keep going with it. Right. Yeah. So you were in the hospital. They had you on diuretics. Did they say, I'll go home? Or did they keep you and watch you? I was admitted on a Monday and I got to leave a Wednesday after I took my Lasix. They gave me, I don't remember the other medications they gave me. But I'm pretty sure they were watching, obviously, my output and everything. I lost another 20 pounds, just wow. the fluid alone. And yeah, just because of that. Yeah. A lot um, of fluid. Oh, yeah. God. That's like a baby. A big yeah, baby. Again. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. You ended up going into heart failure and needing a pacemaker. Tell us about that. Yeah, the pacemaker was with the bradycardia. I was told as a teenager from my cardiologist you have a slow heartbeat, you're going to need a pacemaker. And me being a teenager was just like, I'm fine. I feel fine. I don't need this. So then I got into college and I remember sitting in class and I just felt very tired and I started drinking coffee all the time and I would actually feel my resting heart rate in class. And it was 40 consistently. Then they ordered a Holzer monitor for me overnight. I actually worked at a doctor's office and a doctor that I really looked up to read the results of the Holzer monitor. And she's like, your heart stops in the middle of the night. I was like, well, I wasn't aware of that. She's like, it stops. You need a pacemaker. I took her advice. And when I was at my birthday and I got it, and it was actually a really simple procedure, I totally built it up in my mind. It was really simple. It was my first experience going under. Right, because, because you a were a baby. baby. Yeah. You didn't remember yeah. that. No. You were in college. You had a doctor that you mm -hmm. really trusted who said, yeah, yeah, you really do need this. Yeah. And you decided, okay. Now, was that open heart for you or were they able to do it closed heart? A closed. It was just like the incision on top of the skin. They put the lead in. I guess they tried to put a second lead in, but because of the transposition, they weren't able to get it really in there. So I just have one lead in there mm -hmm. right now. Monday, I actually get the results of how long my battery is. I think I need a new battery by the end of the year, mm -hmm. which is fine. I heard that's not even a big deal. Right, right. Okay, so you were 22 when you got a pacemaker and you had been mm -hmm. really tired before that. Did you feel like the bionic woman after you got your pacemaker? Yes, I definitely exercised more. I wasn't some Olympic athlete or anything, but I definitely mm -hmm. took more control of biking and going out forest preserves and walking a lot more and I felt way more energized for sure yeah you live in a beautiful part of the country where people like mm -hmm. to get out and walk yes. I'm sure that was a huge boon to you to all of a sudden have more energy even walking between classes and studying at night how were you able to study before if you were so exhausted coffee that's where my <laughs> addiction started was in college which I'm sure a lot of people can relate to that what kind of prognosis did the doctors give you after you got your pacemaker? I had a cardiologist from when I was very little that I saw every year. I knew her very well, and then she retired. That was really sad because she was like the only person in the world that knew more about me than myself. So she referred me to this other man, and he was really nice. I only met him twice, though, but he was like just based on the amount of physical activity you do, you'd probably be fine having a kid. I was 22, so I wasn't super serious about it yet. I hadn't met anyone or anything. So I was just like, okay, this is something to think about in the future. Texas Heart Institute were offering us a mechanical heart. And he said, no, Dad, I've had enough. Give it to someone who's worthy. My father promised me a golden dress to twirl in. He held my hand and asked me where I wanted to go. Whatever strife or conflict that we experienced in our long career together was always healed by humor. Heart to Heart with Michael, please join us every Thursday at noon Eastern as we talk with people from around the world who have experienced those most difficult moments.
This content is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. The opinions expressed in the podcast are not those of Hearts Unite the Globe, but of the hosts and guests, and are intended to spark discussion about issues pertaining to congenital heart disease or bereavement. You are listening to Heart to Heart with Anna. If you have a question or comment that you would like addressed on our show, please send an email to Anna Jaworski at Anna at hearttoheartwithanna.com. That's Anna at hearttoheartwithanna.com. Now, back to Heart to Heart with Anna. Barbara, before the break, we learned a bit about your heart defect and the procedures that you've had. But now let's fast forward to when you're a full-fledged adult. So why yeah. don't you talk to us about after you got even a little bit older and you met Mr. Wright and mm-hmm. how you felt about having children after you had met somebody that you wanted to share your life with? I was very nervous about it just because I had this condition and I wanted him to understand there's a possibility that I won't be able to do it or my cardiologist might advise me against it, but he was very understanding and he said, we can always adopt. I felt very comfortable having him as a partner and with how he was treating me and how he reacted to that. So I felt pretty comfortable with that and it wasn't a huge stressor like, oh, if you can't have children, that's it. It's nice that you found a man who was so understanding and so loving towards you. Is adoption something that you actually thought about? A a little bit. It would have been thought about more had I not conceived right away. I thought about it a little bit, but I wanted to try after getting the go-ahead from my doctor that I should probably be okay. I put adoption out of my mind at that point. I wanted to at least see what I was capable of before I looked into that further. Now, did you know anybody else who was able to conceive who had a heart defect similar to you? I did not, but with Facebook and joining different congenital heart defect groups, I was able to come across moms with TGA who obviously successfully gave birth. One, I saw had four kids. So I'm like, this is doable. This isn't something that is totally out of my reach. Mm -hmm. That had to be inspiring to you to meet other people who had the same heart defect. And had they also had the mustard? Some did, yes, because I'm in a group specifically for TGA and mustard and sunning, and yes, yeah. Yeah. Okay, in your bio, we learned that you successfully carried one son to term. Can you tell us about that first pregnancy, how everybody felt? How did your parents feel? How did your husband feel? And how did you feel? Everyone was very excited. On my husband's side, especially, it was going to be the first grandchild on that side. For my mom, it was going to be her third, but there's a big gap between my brother and I. So there's a big age gap between my niece and my baby. So it was still exciting on both ends. And I felt good that whole pregnancy. In the summer, two months before I gave birth, I was able to walk 20,000 steps one day, like no sweat. It was like, I can give birth. This should be fine. (laughs) Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, had your mother been told anything when you were a child as far as whether or not you should be able to carry a baby to term? No. And she did tell me if somebody had told me, I would have told you by this Mm -hmm. point already. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Did you have the same cardiologist all through this that you had as a little girl growing up? I did not. She retired when I became a young adult. I think the last interaction I had with her was when she suggested the pacemaker. I got the pacemaker from a cardiac surgeon. And then I moved on to a new cardiologist, but he was a pediatric cardiologist. And since I was thinking about having children, I'm like, I probably should see someone where I'm not in the waiting room with a jungle theme around me if I want to have kids. So I was fortunate enough to ask my cousin, he's an infectious disease doctor, who he recommended as far as cardiology goes. I found a woman who worked with women with heart defects, who was a cardiologist, and then she worked with their maternal fetal medicine team, the OB team, and they work closely together and monitor patients. Mm -hmm. So were you considered a high-risk pregnancy? Absolutely, yes. Mm -hmm. Now, did they check the baby out while you were pregnant? Yes, at 20 weeks, they looked at his heart with a fetal echo, and they determined there were no glaring issues, but they did say little holes are not detected sometimes till a stethoscope is actually put to their chest after they're born or they get an echo. But more than likely, they're not. He's going to have an echo when he's born, just to make sure. Right, right. What we didn't say in your bio is that you've had a second child. What's really remarkable about the second child is that you had it during COVID. 
So talk yeah. to us about what this experience was like giving birth during COVID. It was terrifying. When I found out I was pregnant, I was elated. I was happy I was going to have a sibling for my oldest. But not only COVID was happening, but then I found out this baby was breech and that I would have to have a C-section if they couldn't turn him, which I was scheduled for. I had a procedure where they attempted to turn him, which is called a version. And that was the most pain I'd probably ever experienced in my life. And some women, it works right away. Some women, it doesn't. It's 50-50. I knew going into it that it would be 50-50. But that procedure was the height of COVID in our city. Everyone had masks on. All these people were pushing on my stomach, like oh, seven wow. people in the room with masks on. That was stressful. And I knew going into it, it was 50-50 and it did not work. He didn't turn very stubborn baby. And they're like, you're going to have to have a C-section. And that was something I knew with my first pregnancy was a last resort. Again, I looked on Facebook. I said, are there any mustards who've had C-sections? A lot of women replied, actually, the doctor thought it would be easier on my heart to have a C-section. I preferred I had one and everything was fine. So that helped me a lot. I was way more concerned about my C-section at that point than I was with COVID. I mean, it was still scary. I couldn't bring my husband to the doctor. I had to go in and go out, wear a mask. And this was a huge house where I knew there were COVID patients walking in. I had to have my temperature taken. I had to have the nasal swab before having the version because it was a hospital procedure. Yeah, Uh, I was crying with that one. And then I had to have it again before my scheduled C-section just to make sure I tested negative for COVID. Wow, now how long was this labor? Since it was a planned C-section, it was not long. It was literally come to the hospital at 11 o'clock, get you prepped and everything. This is what's gonna happen. The doctor, the OB came in, she kind of felt my stomach. She's like, you know, he's in a better position. We're gonna try a version again. We want you to have this vaginal birth. If we can help it, we're prepared for the C-section. We know what to do. Let's try this. He's in a better position. So they lay me down on the C-section table. They try it. Didn't take. They're like, all right, we're doing the C-section. I'm like, yeah, you might as well. I'm glad you guys tried. I talked to my husband the whole C-section. It was like having a conversation with someone and just being. So you weren't totally knocked out or anything? No, oh no. Yeah, no. Ah. I was quite awake and I remember every minute of it and I remember seeing him for the first time and this wave of relief over me I was like oh my god this is done he's here <laughs> but the one thing that did upset me was I found out a week before I had the procedure the c-section that because of what happened with the heart failure that I had to be put on a cardiac floor after I gave birth to monitor my heart and they're like because of covid your baby cannot leave the birthing floor I was like, I'm not going to be with my baby for the first 24 hours of his life. Oh, my God, he's not going to know who I am. (laughs) I was upset. And I'm like, you know what? If this is the worst thing that happens to you right now during this whole experience, fine. Maybe I can get some sleep or something. Let my husband stay in a room with him, though, for a night. And then I was able to rejoin them the next day. Hi, my name is Jamie Alcroft. And I just published my new book, The Tin Man Diaries. It's an amazing story of my sudden change of heart as I went through a heart and liver transplant. I can think of no better way to read the Tin Man Diaries than to cuddle up in your favorite Hearts Unite the Globe sweatshirt and your favorite hot beverage, of course, in your Hearts Unite the Globe mug, both of which are available at the Hug Podcast Network online store. Or visit heartsunitetheglobe.org. Night Forever by the Baby Blue Sound Collective. I think what I love so much about this CD is that some of the songs were inspired by the patients. Many listeners will understand many of the different songs and what they've been inspired by. Our new album will be available on iTunes, Amazon.com, Spotify. I love the fact that the proceeds from this CD are actually going to help those with congenital heart defects. Enjoy the music. Home Tonight Forever. Heart to Heart with Anna is a presentation of Hearts Unite the Globe and is part of the Hug Podcast Network. Hearts Unite the Globe is a nonprofit organization devoted to providing resources to the congenital heart defect community to uplift, empower, and enrich the lives of our community members. If you would like access to free resources pertaining to the CHD community, please visit our website at www.congenitalheartdefects.com for information about CHD 
the hospitals that treat children with CHD, summer camps for CHD survivors, and much, much more. Barbara, before the break, we were talking about your ability to have two healthy babies, which is really exciting. Giving birth and dealing with pregnancy is very different than dealing with a toddler. So tell me about how you're doing today with a toddler and a newborn baby. We were talking before, and you said that the babies are three years apart. So you've got a very active toddler. He's very active. He doesn't take naps anymore. I mean, he could take naps. He'd just be up till 11 at night. So I decided to just make that switch. I'd rather put you to bed early than deal with that. It got easier once my newborn schedule kind of is a little more predictable. Mm-hmm. So I'm able to kind of figure out what our daily routine is a lot better. And it's nice that it's the summertime so I can take my kid outside. I kind of dread the winter, but <laughs> he's keeping me active too. And despite how I complain about it all the time. It helps me be active. It helps me move and helps me get my health back. Now, control. did you have the same problem with the swelling with the second baby no. that you did? Isn't that amazing? They told me every OB appointment, we knew what happened with you last time. It wasn't a surprise for what you have, your heart condition, but we are prepared to make sure it does not happen this time because we can anticipate it. And they did amazing. The anesthesiology team, especially. Mm-hmm. They were really the forefront of that and making sure that I did not have the fluid retention and the fact that they put me on that cardiac floor. They kept me way longer than usual. Well, with COVID now, you have your baby. You basically stay a day or two and you're out because of what's happening with COVID. But with me, they're like, we're not going to send you home until we know 100% that you're fine. So I stayed. I had the baby on a Tuesday. I think I went home on Saturday. Wow. Yeah, I was there a while just because the swelling didn't happen with my first until four days later so they're like we want to get you past that fourth day make sure then send you home so you were able to be laying flat or having your feet up and elevated where you didn't with the first child because you already went home and were taking care of the baby Yes. And I was super nervous. I'm like, oh God, what if I get home? And after all this laying down, once I start moving, it's going to happen again. It happened a little bit on the car ride home, but it went away. I rested. My husband took over taking care of our toddler. He's like, just take care of the newborn. Just don't get up. But obviously with a C-section, you're not doing a lot anyway. It was controlled way better. And the doctors even told me if something was going to happen, it probably would have happened at this point anyway. We wouldn't have sent you home if we thought that this was going to happen again. Now, since COVID was raging at that time, and you said the baby and your husband were in one part of the hospital and you were in another part for four days, were you separated for those four entire days? No, just for 24 hours. So they could monitor my heart on the cardiac floor. The reason they weren't letting any babies off the birthing floor just because of COVID, they don't want them going up and down in the elevator or anything, any reason at all. So yeah, I was in the cardiac unit and then my husband and my son were up for a very good work, and he was able to at least be with him for those 24 hours, and then I was able to meet them afterwards. And then I stayed in the hospital with my newborn while my husband had to go home and take care of our toddler. Oh, wow. So they did let you do rooming in in a cardiac ward? No, I was moved back to the OB floor. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Mm-hmm. Wow. This was a lot yeah. of transition <laughs> yeah. for you. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. So did the OB nurses know what to do with you, given your special condition? Yeah. I mean, they were given their orders from the doctor, and they had wonderful nurses. Each experience, even with my first one, the nurses were amazing. They couldn't have done it without them. They knew exactly what to do. It sounds like you had a very blessed second experience, especially given all of this was going on during COVID-19, which in and of itself was scary. Yeah, I've looked at the numbers and the day my son was born was the day the highest number of people tested positive for COVID in Illinois. (laughs) And I was just like, oh my goodness. (laughs) So yeah, it was scary. Yeah. What advice do you have, Barbara Ann, for young people today who might also be born with transposition and who might want to have a family? I'd say make sure that you have an active lifestyle. Giving birth is a lot of work. Carrying a baby, growing a baby is a lot of work. So make sure you're capable of walking a little bit and you can endure that. You don't have a lot of shortness of breath or dizzy episodes. Make sure you have a cardiologist who is an adult cardiologist who can work with your OB and you're going to have to find a specialist OB. They work hand in hand together. And like, I was very fortunate. I did my research. They had the OB team 
and the cardiac team, they talked with each other. It was new and exciting for them, but I had experienced people like me before, which is very reassuring. Right. You weren't a novel case. You were no. yeah. a, you were a condition that yeah. they had experienced in the past, which, yeah, I'm sure that had to give you a little bit of a sense of relief. Yeah. This is an experienced team. And you were very much in communication with your anesthesiologist. I think that's really, really good. It sounds like you really knew your team and your team really knew you. Yeah. Yeah. They were awesome. There were a few things where I mean, I'd see my OB, they're like, you can drink coffee. And I'm like, I don't think my cardiologist wants me to drink a ton of coffee. So <laughs> some of the things were like a little, not all there, but it was fine. I like what you said about make sure that you're seeing a specialist for yeah. adults with congenital heart disease, because this is not your typical pregnancy. And your heart does get stressed because your heart beats for the baby. Yep. And Absolutely. you have to be able to push the blood, not just through your body, but through the baby's body. So that really yes. is very taxing. Tell us about what you have planned for your future. Do you plan on having more children? I do not. I think I'm done. I'm <laughs> pretty sure I'm done with it. So I, you know, my two healthy boys, I'm perfectly happy with that. And just watching them grow and just focusing on myself now and trying to lose the baby weight, obviously, and running around with my little one and just appreciating them and everything. How is Big Brother handling having a baby in the house? He's good. The first two weeks, he totally ignored him. And they're like, that's normal. Some kids are in their face. Some kids don't even care. But now it's the cutest thing. And he really loves him. And he's really happy to have someone else here, I think, because he hasn't been seeing people a lot with COVID. I can tell they're going to be really close. And that makes me really happy. Oh, I just love it. Thank you so much for sharing your story, Barbara Ann, and for coming on the program with me today. Thank you for having me. This is wonderful. And I just hope people who have TGA or any heart defect and want to be moms, it's not impossible. It's absolutely, with modern medicine, you can do it. Absolutely. You are a living testament to that. <laughs> and I just love your story. Well, that's it for today, folks. Thank you so much for joining us. I want to give a shout out to our newest patron, Dr. Brandon Lane Phillips has joined our Patreon team, and now he is a patron of Heart to Heart with Anna. If you're interested in becoming a patron, just look in the show notes, and there will be a link there. It's really super easy to do. Just click on the link. It'll take you over. And for a very small amount even, you can make a big difference in our programming. Thanks for listening today, and remember, my friends, you are not alone. Thank you again for joining us this week. We hope you have been inspired and empowered to become an advocate for the congenital heart defect community. Heart to Heart with Anna, with your host Anna Jaworski, can be heard every Tuesday at 12 noon Eastern Time.